and uh, we're coming to some final stages of it. And uh, it's now described by the writer John uh, receiving this message as being a little scroll, a little book now, meaning there's just a little bit left in it. But what is left in it is indeed powerful and dramatic. It actually covers the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Let's take a look at it. Chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as though it were the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel whom I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things which are in it, that there should be delay or time, delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hands, uh, hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again without about uh, or before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. You must do it. Well, this is indeed an awesome passage. I see in chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, the appearance of a mighty angel, and I noticed how many commentators said it's Jesus Christ. If this is Jesus Christ, then it's the only place where Christ is called an angel. Uh, with the exception of the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we have the angel of the Lord as a reference to Jesus Christ, but we do not have an example in the New Testament unless this is it. As I look at the um, matter of an angel, I know that it's mentioned 201 times in the Bible, but uh, in the book of Revelation, it has a special prominence, the role of angels. And the question is, who is this angel? Because it's a very dramatic picture of this angel's authority and his announcement and all of that. So I want to take you on a little quick trip looking at the identity of this angel in verse 1. And I want you to see two things. One is that he is characterized by things associated with our Lord's presence and our Lord's attributes. And that makes a lot of people believe that he is Jesus Christ. For an example, look at verse 1 again, chapter 10. It says he was clothed with a cloud. Turn to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. We often speak of the cloud as the Shekinah glory of God. Shekinah means to dwell, and God's glory, meaning his essential nature and attributes, were manifested or displayed by a giant cloud. Now when this cloud came over the holy place, of the tabernacle and temple, I should tell you that the cloud was quite thick, so thick that it uh, would not allow the priest to even minister. They could hardly see in the place, much less breathe. There was a tremendous uh, visible manifestation of the glory of God, the Shekinah presence of the Lord being manifested in the cloud. So when it says the angels clothed with a cloud, you can't help but think of this. Look at Exodus 40, 34, last chapter of Exodus. It says, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So you can understand when people read, here's a strong, mighty angel uh, clothed with a cloud. Well, that's usually indicating divine presence and attributes. Uh, turn to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. And look at verse 3. Psalm 104, verse 3. And once again, we see how clouds are associated with God's mighty presence and power. Uh, verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind. And once again, the clouds of God's glory, clouds associated with the divine presence. Turn to Revelation 1-7. There are a lot of people who believe this is Jesus because of this verse in the same book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 7, says of the second coming of Christ in power and great glory, Behold, he cometh with what? Clouds and every eye shall see him. Uh, Matthew tells us in chapter uh, 24 that they are clouds of glory. Again, clouds associated with the glory of the Lord and a manifestation of his presence so that we would know he is there. Also, we read in Revelation 10:1. in addition to being clothed with a cloud, there's a rainbow upon his head, verse 1. Turn to Psalm 89. Psalm chapter 89. There's a rainbow on the head of this mighty angel who's going to announce that the mystery of God is finished and God's program is going to be wrapped up shortly now. In Psalm 89, once again we see that even a rainbow is associated with God and his character and his attributes. Uh, verse 1 and 2. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very what? Heavens. In the heavens is a manifestation of the faithfulness of God. Look at verse 8. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord, it was a strong angel, Revelation 10, 1. Who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or to thy faithfulness round about thee? Look at verse 33. It says, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor will I alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever. His throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon. And as a faithful witness in what? In heaven. Well, is there anyone here that just thinking off the top of your head from Bible knowledge can think of what the faithful witness in the sky is that reminds us that God will not break his promise? The rainbow. And in chapter 10, verse 1, there's a rainbow about the head of the strong angel. And the rainbow is the sign of God's covenant to Noah, that he will not destroy the world with a flood again. And folks in St. Louis are studying that passage carefully these days. <laughs> Our daughter lives about four blocks from the flood in St. Louis, so we're concerned too. But according to the Bible, the entire earth will not be inundated with water as it once was in the days of Noah. And what is God's sign? A rainbow. And the Bible calls it a testimony to God's faithfulness. So this wonderful attribute of God, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. Uh, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful. 
Uh, faithful is he who said it, faithful is he who will perform it. God is faithful who has called you to the fellowship of his son. Uh, the Lord is faithful who will establish you from the wicked one. We have all these verses about the wonderful attribute of God that he is faithful. You can count on him. Jesus never fails. Now, that's uh, really a statement to the uh, character of God. So when you read about the strong angel being clothed with a cloud and a rainbow on his head, I mean, it looks like Jesus Christ, or at least the Lord in some manifestation. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 4. And some believe that this just kind of seals it. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse 3, it pictures God the Father on his throne, the throne in heaven. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a what around the throne? What does it say? A rainbow in sight like an emerald. So even around the throne of God is a reminder of the faithfulness of God. When you come to, to God's throne, the Bible says, let's come boldly into the throne of grace where we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's Hebrews 4 and verse 16. But earlier in chapter 2 it says that he partook of flesh and blood and destroyed the works of the devil through his own death on the cross and he became a merciful and faithful high priest uh, by the things which he suffered in our behalf. And therefore he's able to comfort all of those who are suffering by the comfort that he himself experienced and gives. So clothed with a crowd, rainbow about his head, but there's a third statement in Revelation 10.1, and that is that his face was as though it were the sun. Look back at Revelation 1, verse 16. Revelation 1, 16. It says, He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance, his facial appearance, was as the what? Sun, shining in its strength. So once again, you have another aspect of the divine presence which causes people to say, hey, this is an unusual angel. Look back at chapter 10, verse 1 again. There's a fourth thing. It says at the end of the verse, his feet were like pillars of fire. Now those are unusual feet. Look back at chapter 1, verse 15. In describing Jesus Christ again, it says his feet we're like fine brass or bronze as if they burned in a furnace. So the association of feet with the bronze, the burning of a furnace, uh, pillars of fire, there is an association there, although probably pillars of fire, not exactly the same, but the whole idea of fire being used to indicate the judging hand of God. So I have to say about the strong angel looking at his identity that he is characterized by things that are associated with the Lord's presence and attributes. But I'm not convinced that it's Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about uh, you, but I can almost uh, prove to myself several different views in Revelation. Um, I could argue that this is Jesus Christ, and on the basis of what we've said, maybe you're convinced. But uh, as I just go into it a little bit further, I'm not convinced. First of all, in this book, John is told not to worship the angels. And I just cannot see God confusing us in the exact same book of Revelation by making Christ the angel who is to be worshipped in the book. All the angels of God are to worship him, Hebrews 1.6. I think it confuses things. Also, if you'll notice in verse 1, it says, I saw another mighty angel. Now, in Greek, we have two words for another. Another of a different kind, heteros, and another of the same kind, alos. And it's the second one here. Therefore, we must look to another angel that's of similar nature. Well, we don't have two Christs, folks. We only have one Christ. So who is this another strong angel? Was it ever mentioned uh, in the book before? Yes, go back to chapter 5, verse 2. The scene is in heaven. And uh, the, the scroll is being taken out of the Father's hand by the Lord Jesus here. But verse 2 says, I saw what kind of an angel? Strong. strong. Now in King James, it's strong in chapter 5, verse 2. And it's mighty in chapter 10, verse 1. But in Greek, it's the exact same word. 
So if I'm looking in 10 and it's another of the same kind as the angel in chapter 5, verse 2, a strong angel who proclaims uh, who's worthy to open the book, it's obvious that that strong angel in 5, 2 is not Jesus because he, in fact, is separated from Jesus, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the lamb that has been slain. So you say, well, who is this? Well, we do know that Gabriel's name means strength of God. He is a strong angel. He was used to announce momentous occasions, such as the birth of the Lord, the Lord Jesus. Uh, Gabriel, Gabriel was also involved in the prophetic revelations in the book of Daniel. So it's very possible that we have Gabriel. Well, you say, well, if it's another angel like Gabriel, who would the other one possibly be? Exactly. Boy, you are great tonight. You've been studying all week, haven't you? Right, it is Michael. Michael, whose name means, who is like God. There was something about Michael's characteristics, his devotion, his dedication to God. Michael is the only angel in the Bible who's called the archangel, the ruling angel. And apparently there's only one. Now guess who is the ruling angel of the demonic world? Satan. I find it interesting that Michael and Satan are in a dispute about the body of Moses in the book of Jude. By the way, Michael doesn't take on Satan and neither should you. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And we need to understand that. Our confidence is in the Lord, not in our ability to cope with demonic power. But it's interesting to me that not only is this angel characterized by the Lord's presence and attributes, but he's connected to another strong angel, which means we've got to have one like Gabriel or someone like him, and I vote for Michael. First of all, I think Michael is the one that reflects the attributes of God. That's why his name means who is like God. He was devoted to God. He, he manifests God's love, especially for the people of Israel. Turn to Daniel, please. Daniel chapter 10. Now, Daniel is quoted many, many times in Revelation, and I think the connection here is too powerful to ignore. In Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, it says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, this is dealing with a ruler, an authority. The Bible speaks of principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world. It's talking about demonic power. There's a prince of the kingdom of Persia who withstood me one and 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. This is the Messiah talking, a very interesting struggle. We're not teaching Daniel 10, but... Um, uh, our pastor did recently, oh, a few months back, and did a great job with this text, and uh, showed us again that we had uh, a demonic conflict going on behind the scenes of the rulers of the nations of the world that are involved with prophecy. Now, don't be amazed at that, because even at the Battle of Armageddon, it says that demonic forces will go out, uh, unclean spirits like frogs, and will literally gather all the nations of the world to that great battle we call Armageddon. So demonic activity is behind many of the leaders of the nations of the world. Michael is involved here uh, in a protective aspect. Uh, turn please to chapter 12, verse 1. And here you see it in its full force. Michael the archangel. Chapter 12, verse 1. It says, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, who standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Apparently during the tribulation, there's going to be a terrible, terrible uh, persecution of the nation of Israel. Who will stand up and defend them? Bible says Michael will. Well, Revelation uh, agrees with that. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. During the tribulation period, about the middle of it, Satan is going to unleash all of his anger and fury against the people of God. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, There was war in heaven, and who's fighting the dragon? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought on his angels and it was not settled until the fourth quarter. No, that's what it says. 
It says, and prevailed not, neither was their place found in, any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceiveth the whole world, and his angels cast out with him. So you see, folks, I think, if you go back to chapter 10, the, the, the scroll has been unraveled now, and now it's smaller than it was when, when we started. We're unraveling, looking at all the messages, breaking the seals, and uh, now it's a li little, it's smaller than it was. And this is a momentous occasion because... The final seal unravels the trumpets and unravels the bowls of wrath, the seven last plagues, and unravels the terrible thing we call the great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, when Satan unleashes his fury against Israel as never before in history. Michael will stand up. And thus I think it's appropriate that we argue that in chapter 10, verse 1, what we have here is Michael the archangel standing up. And uh, that is my view, and if you don't like it, find your own view. <laughs> now look at chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. After looking at the identity of this angel, take a look at the impact. And the impact's pretty powerful. It pictures really two things, I think. Uh, verse 2, where he had in his hand a little book open. It's already open, so it's referring to the scroll that's already been unraveled. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. What I think you have pictured here is God's control over all. I'll tell you, when you read the last half of the tribulation, you could ask the question, where is God? If you were living on the planet and you saw the terrible judgments, the holocaust of terror and horror that will come on this planet, and you were living here, you would ask the question, where in the world is God? Where is God when we need him? And it will look like everything is chaotic. You think it's chaotic now. Wait till, wait till a tribulation period. It's just everything's going to fall apart. Everything. Governments will fall apart. Panic will be worldwide. Uh, judgments, plagues, uh, millions and millions of people are being killed. It is a worldwide panic state. And it's interesting to see Michael put a foot on the land, a foot on the sea, and swear by the Lord God. That tells me something. God's in charge, folks. He is absolutely in charge. And uh, we don't have anything to wor worry about. A fellow presented to me a, quite a paper. Uh, he doesn't live here, but sent it to me and said he heard one of the tapes. So one of you must have sent him one. But anyway, uh, he sent me a big paper to explain um, the tribulation period. It was interesting. I was reading through it. But he's scaring the daylights out of people. And I thought to myself, there's just one element missing in this whole presentation, and that is that God is in charge. God is in charge. Aren't you glad you're on his side? He's in charge. He's running. Things are not, quote, out of control. They only seem that way. God is in charge. He puts up kings and he takes them down. That's very interesting. Now, I didn't vote for Bill Clinton. So if you, uh, wait, wait, no, no. But I pray for Bill Clinton. And I think that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray for those who are in leadership over it. But I didn't vote for him. So if you did, you got what you deserved. But anyway, no. But seriously, um, do you all remember what happened after the election among the Christians and all the articles that were written in the Christian magazines? It's funny now looking back at it. I mean, it was like the bottom dropped out. It's like God took a vacation or took a nap for a while. How could he let us down like this? You know, God's not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm sorry. Nor does he join United We Stand. I mean, it, this is something we need to understand, you know. God is in control of everything that's happening. Now, now that he's elected, I can say this. I hope you don't get angry. God put Bill Clinton in as President of the United States. Now that one is going to get me in trouble. <laughs> but you don't need to bother writing because I already know what the Bible teaches. So it isn't going to affect me one way or another. Now our problem is we don't know what God wants from day to day and so we don't understand. But God is literally controlling them all. Every last one of them is under his hand. And by the way, he turns them however he wants. I believe that Bill Clinton is having a lot of trouble 
over the homosexual issue because Christians are praying. I really believe. And it looked like it was all over. And all of a sudden, God just said, well, let's give him a little more time. Boom. <laughs> and he twisted Clinton's heart and messed him up a little bit. And he's having a terrible time over this issue. And I just smile. You know, God is answering prayer. You know, then they had that uh, deal on uh, federal funding for abortion. And I, got, I kept the article before it happened and after it happened. Now, before it happened, there is such a joy in, the, in, in Clinton's camp. I mean, this is, this is a slam dunk, folks. We got it made. And then all of a sudden, the Congress votes overwhelmingly the opposite way. Now, I think God's people were praying. That's what I think. And God's people said, Lord, just don't let it happen. Just show them you're in charge. And he hasn't yet recovered from that one. <laughs> now, he has some religious background. I'm just praying the Holy Spirit of God's going to convict that man. And who knows? He may become the giant spiritual leader of America. It could happen. <laughs> but we do need to figure on the worst and hope for the best. But seriously, we need to trust the Lord, don't we? So no matter how bad things are getting, you know, it depends on what your week is like. You know, no matter how bad things get, God is in control. Aren't you glad of that? He's working all things after the counsel of his will. He's going to accomplish his plan. So don't panic. But the impact of this angel not only pictures God's control, but it pictures God's cry for all to hear. Because look what it says in verse 3. The angel cries with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. He's announcing God's intervention in human affairs. Let me show you what I mean. Turn to Job, the book of Job, chapter 4. Job is a book you read when you're really going through hard times. So undoubtedly it's being read frequently among God's people these days. It is an interesting book, don't you think? I love that book. It's a great book. It's the kind of book you have to read at one sitting to really get it. You know, he's got all these friends giving him advice. I love, I love it when he turns to him and says, Miserable comforters are you all. <laughs> you know, you probably wanted to say that to some of your friends when they came along, try to encourage you when you're down, you know. But it's interesting what it says in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Talking again about God's power and his word. It says, by the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. What's he talking about? The destruction of the wicked. The roaring of the what? Lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perisheth for lack of prey and the stout lion's whelps are scattered abroad. And we got, we, got, we got pictured here the judgment of God against the wicked. And it's interesting as you just follow that. Turn to Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31. Now lions are mentioned 144 times in the Bible. Jesus is described as a lion. But Isaiah chapter 31, look at verse 4 and 5. Just seeing the whole impact of the lion roaring and declaring the judgment of God. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 31, look at verse 4 and 5. Just another example. It says, For thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, as the lion or the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them, so shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. Again, the lion in that roar uh, is picturing God's judgment. Turn to Hosea, Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5, and look at verse 14. The impact of this angel is twofold. It pictures God's control as he stands with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea in a dramatic fashion. And it also pictures God's cry and, uh, of judgment to come for everybody to hear, a lion roaring 
in Hosea 5.14, For I will be unto Ephraim like a lion, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. Uh, I, even I, will let them pet me. No, that isn't what it says. It says, I, even I, will tear and go away. I'll take away, and none shall rescue him. Uh, so that picture is fairly consistent. In fact, over in chapter 11, verse 10 of the same book, Hosea, um, it says in verse 10, They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. So that, that's pretty consistent. You'll find something also in Amos uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. Uh, where it says, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? And that's the one I believe that is probably being inferred um, and implied in Revelation chapter 10. Amos 3, 8. Dealing with the Lord proclaiming, speaking, and who can but prophesy? And what's the end of the chapter? You must prophesy. So I think we have a direct application in Revelation 10 of Amos 3, 8, of God roaring like a lion, announcing his judgment. And what do we do who are believers? We must preach it. We must proclaim it. Repent and turn to the Lord before it's too late. Back to Revelation 10. Uh, the impact of this angel is certainly a powerful thing, but look at the instruction of a voice from heaven in verse 4. We're still looking at the appearance of this mighty angel. We're basically examining three things, his identity, uh, the impact that he's having uh, by way of this uh, illustration in verses uh, 2 and 3, and then the instruction of a voice from heaven. And uh, I think none other than God himself. But it says, verse 3, He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the th seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Well, I have a problem with that. Why in the world would you seal up? I thought Revelation was taking the seals off. Now, in the book of Daniel, I can understand, as it's written in the 12th chapter, seal these things up until the time of the end. But in Revelation, we have the time of the end. So why does he say, don't write down what those seven thunders just uttered? Uh, just to show you how critical this is in terms of, uh, you know, understanding what's going on here, look at Revelation 22, the last chapter, and verse 10. He saith unto me, to John, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Daniel says, uh, until the time of the end, seal it up. Now in Revelation, almost quoting the, uh, the passage, only putting it in the opposite form, he says, don't seal up because the time is here. So let the whole world know. So I ask you, what is it all about in chapter 10 when a voice, presumably from God, comes out of heaven after these seven thunders roar and the mighty angel is picturing this dramatic scene, what would be the point of the voice saying, oh, by the way, don't let anybody know what was just said? And it is my opinion, based upon how the passage flows with him eventually eating it and being sweet in his mouth as he learns God's in control, but bitter in his stomach when he learns what's going to happen to the people of God. It is my opinion that what it is referring to is the terrible suffering of God's people. That's what I think it's referring to. Seal it up. Don't say anything. And then to teach John this negative aspect of the blessing of God's answer in the tribulation. Positive, yes, God's in control. Uh, God's going to rule the world. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Yes, praise God. Avenging the blood of all the martyrs of the past. Yes, hallelujah. Praise be to our God. But there's a negative thought that's in this book, and that is it's going to turn bitter in your stomach. As you will see that God's people are going to suffer terribly. And that suffering is going to be described in chapter 12 and following. Now, in verse 5 to 7, we have the announcement of this mighty angel. 
We looked at the appearance of the angel, but the announcement of this mighty angel. The angel, verse 5, whom I saw standing upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. Now, I want you to see just three things here. Number one, he symbolized his dependency upon God's authority and sovereignty over all. He's standing on the sea and on the earth, and he lifted his hand to heaven. I like that. He symbolized his dependency upon God's authority and sovereignty over all. God, this is your moment. What a beautiful picture that is. The second thing he did, he not only symbolized uh, God's authority and sovereignty and his dependency on it, but he swore by the eternal power of God himself. Uh, this is very unusual. It says in verse 6, And swore by him that liveth forever and ever. James 5.12 says, Swear not at all, his advice to us. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. You don't say to somebody, Hey, I swear on a, ten I swear on a stack of Bibles, I'm telling you the truth. Well, why bring in the stack of Bibles? Why don't you just tell the truth? <laughs> this was common in Jesus' day. I swear by the temple and the pillars of it that I'm telling you the truth. Well, Jesus said, don't swear by any of it. Just let your yes be yes and your no, no. Just tell the truth all the time. Then we won't have to do that. Hey, I swear to God, man, I'm telling you the truth. Hey, don't bring God into it. Just tell the truth. Interesting, isn't it, how we use that? But there is a valid swearing uh, that's done by God himself. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says God can't swear by anything higher than himself. And by two immutable things, his own character and his oath, his promise, by which it's impossible for God to lie, we have a sure anchor of the soul, knowing that God's going to do what he said. Who God is and God's word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Those are two things that do not change. I am the Lord, I change not. Two immutable things, says Hebrews 6.18. Two things that do not change. God himself and God's word. God will keep his word. You can count on it. And it's a sure anchor to the soul when we understand that. That all of God's promises are built on who God is and what God says, not what man does. So I find it extremely impressive that this mighty angel will swear by him that liveth forever and ever. He swore by the eternal power of God in creation because he said, who created heaven? The point is, this is his. He makes this dramatic announcement and tells the whole world, because in the next chapter we're going to learn that the announcement is given that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And so this mighty, mighty angel swearing by him who created it all and said, I just want to remind you, he made everything there is. Everything in heaven, everything in earth, everything in the sea, he made it all. Every last parcel of it. And it's by him that I swear time is going to be no more. The end is here. The mystery of God will be finished. I like that, don't you? It's kind of dramatic. Gets me excited. Now, you're probably sitting there saying, I don't know, I don't see it. No. Okay, he not only symbolized God's sovereignty and authority over everything, and not only swore by the eternal power of God himself in creation that it all belongs to him, and he knows how he's going to wrap it all up. But number three, he stated that God's plans were on schedule and would be fulfilled exactly the way God intended. Aren't you glad of that? We are not one day behind or one day ahead of God's plan. It's going to happen right on schedule. You say, well, do you have any advanced information? No, I don't. I don't know. We don't know the day nor the hour and the Son of Man comes. And people tell me all the time, I didn't say month and year. No, that's just an idiom for you don't know. And I feel like adding dummy. You know, it's easy for us, isn't it, to think that we know some inside information. No, we don't. We don't know. But God does. God wants you to trust him. You don't even know what a day is going to bring forth. Jesus told you not even to worry about tomorrow, because sufficient unto that day is the evil thereof. What that basically means is there's so much trouble tomorrow, if you knew it in advance, you couldn't handle it. So God only gives it to you one day at a time. You know, a lot of us think, boy, I hope tomorrow's a good day. 
You know, I've read through the Bible on this matter, and I believe that God doesn't teach that. God teaches there's a lot of trouble tomorrow. You say, boy, you aren't very encouraging. <laughs> hey, there's going to be a lot of hassles. There are going to be difficulties tomorrow. There are going to be problems. No, no, I'm, I determine I am going to have a good day. You are not in charge of it. God has ways of messing your plans up. There's a lot of trouble every day. Man seems to be born for trouble rather than for blessing. But aren't you glad that in the Lord we got, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? So it doesn't matter what's collapsing around us. We're in the Lord. He's in charge. Everything's working out according to his plan. And we're all going to die on time. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And if we're alive and remain, we're caught up to be with the Lord anyway. So let the MasterCard go to the Antichrist. Amen. <laughs> we're out of here. Now, that's not a justification for being in debt at all. Please stay out of debt. Now, how do we know that he's stating God's plans are on schedule? Well, look at this verse. First of all, the end of verse 6, that there should be time no more or no longer. The idea is delay. Uh, it, it doesn't mean, some people have the idea that uh, time, like the sequence of time, 24-hour day, clocks, watches, and all that will be destroyed at this point. No, that isn't the point at all. The point is that the time of the end that we've heard about that's coming and all of that, um, we don't have any more delay now. This is it. The angel's announcing the last three and a half years are wrapping it up. The mystery of God's going to be finished. It's going to be done. The word finished, it is done or finished, is, has an interesting usage in this, in this book later on. Turn to chapter 16. In chapter 16, we have the seven last plagues. And the last plague has an interesting statement. Verse 17 of chapter 16. And the seventh angel poured out his vial or his bowl into the earth, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying what? It is done. It is done. Back in chapter 10, during the blowing of the seventh trumpet, it will be finished. It will be done. The seventh trumpet blows over the entire last half of the tribulation period. The seventh trumpet announces the seven last plagues, which are the final wrath of God being poured out upon an unbelieving world that's turned their back on him. Now the Bible says in chapter 10, verse 7, the mystery of God should be finished as he's declared to his servants the prophets. Now what in the world is he talking about here? The word mystery used 22 times, it's plural form five more times, 27 times. A mystery, something that was not known previously but is now un unveiled. I found the following, I looked up all 27. We have the mystery or the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus speaking about how it would grow during uh, this age. We have the mystery of Israel's blindness, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's sort of related. We have the mystery of the rapture, that we will not all die. Some of us will be alive, but we will all be changed. It was no mystery that people would die and be resurrected, but it was a mystery that there's going to be a rapture of the church. Uh, we have the mystery of his will which according to Ephesians 1.9 is when he's going to gather all things in one, in Christ, under his headship, probably referring to the millennial age. We have the mystery of Christ himself. The uh, Bible even calls it Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have the mystery of Christ and the church, pictured by marriage in Ephesians 5.32. We have the mystery of the gospel, Ephesians 6.19. The mystery of iniquity is already at work. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. We have the mystery of God, uh, which is referring to Christ in Colossians 2, 2, that in him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We have the mystery of the faith, which those that are leaders in our church are supposed to hold on to. That's interesting. We have the mystery of godliness, that God was manifest in the flesh. The whole mystery about how God became a man, which was hidden in the Old Testament, revealed, of course, when Christ came. We have the mystery of the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks 
in Revelation 1.20. We have the mystery of Babylon the Great, Revelation 17.5, uh, also called the mystery of the woman in chapter 17, verse 7. I just gave them all to you. What's missing? The one in chapter 10, verse 7, the mystery of God. Well, that's interesting. There's not a whole lot of information on this. What do we uh, conclude? Well, we know that it says in the beginning of the verse, verse 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Look at chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The mystery of God that's going to be finished is how God's going to wrap everything up. The mystery of his will, Ephesians 1, 9, when Christ will rule and reign over the entire world. Apparently that's what's being pictured. And we also have chapter 16 that we looked at a moment ago, verse 17, that when the last plague is poured out, it's finished, it's done. Picking up the words here that the mystery of God will be finished, it will be done. The mystery of God is why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Why, O oh Lord, have you let this thing go on? And the mystery of God will be finished in the tribulation as we will all see that God had a plan he worked it perfectly, and he accomplished his will, and his son Jesus will reign over everything. Now the last three verses, we've got to wrap it up. Chapter 10, verse 8 to um, 11, last uh, four verses, is a very interesting thing. I call it the application of the message. We looked at the appearance of a mighty angel in the first four verses, the announcement of this angel in verses 5 to 7, and then finally the application of this message. Very interesting. To summarize, John eats the scroll, at least the remaining part of it, the announcement of the seventh angel. He eats it. I'd like you to notice three things. One, it illustrated a previous revelation. It illustrated a previous revelation. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. When John did this, when he ate it, and it was sweet in his mouth but bitter in his stomach, it illustrated a previous revelation. And that may give us a clue as to what's going on here. Ezekiel chapter 2. And look at verse 9. Ezekiel 2, verse 9, down to 3 verse 3. It says, And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a book or scroll was in it. He spread it before me. It was written within and without, same way it's described in Revelation 5. And it was written in it, listen to this, lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat what thou findest. Eat this book or scroll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll. And he said unto me, Son of man, eat and fill thy belly or stomach with this scroll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth like honey for sweetness. But what happens, it turns bitter in the stomach as it pictures the suffering of the people of God. So what I'm saying to you is that I believe that is what is quoted in Revelation and what Revelation is having John do is illustrating a previous revelation that was about the pain, the lamentation, the mourning, the woe, the awfulness of what the tribulation would bring. Blessing, yes, because God's taking over and finishing this a whole mess, but pain because of what the people of God would experience. And the uh, second thing I would mention about Revelation 10, if you want to flip back there, is that it certainly involved a peculiar response because in his mouth it was sweet, but in his stomach it was bitter. And finally, that it indicated a powerful responsibility. When John heard what, was, what God was going to do, it was sweet to his mouth. It's sweet to all of us to learn. Our God reigns. It's sweet to all of us to learn. The Lord Jesus Christ will rule and reign over the entire world. The Lord will defeat all the nations of the world and come against Jerusalem. It's sweet to us. But to those of us who love the Lord and are mature, there is a bitterness of soul. A bitterness in two areas. First, the people of God who will suffer terribly in the tribulation. 
a multitude that no man can number, the Bible says, who are going to be killed for their faith in Jesus. And number two, there's a bitterness over those who are unbelievers who will be lost forever. And so a powerful responsibility is laid on him. Thou must prophesy. Preach it. And interesting that it says so clearly in Revelation 10, mentioning a favorite phrase dealing with God reaching the world, it says about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Preach it, John. Proclaim it. Don't hesitate to say what needs to be said, no matter how awful it, it hits you as you think about all the tragedies that are going to happen. It's God's message. Now you proclaim it. And I close with this. I sat in the office of Israel's premier several years ago in Jerusalem with several cabinet members, and we were talking about prophecy. I was in a congress for the peace of Jerusalem, and uh, he asked me about the tribulation period. He said, do you believe in the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, we've already suffered terribly. And our rabbis tell us that Isaiah 53 has been fulfilled in the Holocaust under Hitler. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The he is the servant of the Lord and is referring to the nation of Israel, he said. I said, you know, there's a prime minister, not pr premier, prime minister Begin. I said, prime minister, I do understand that you don't want to suffer ever again. You have a memorial and a monument here in the city, Yad Hashem, a memorial to the name in which you tell the whole story of six million Jews being slaughtered, and killed, tortured under the Nazi regime. I can understand. But I said, one of your own, Yeshua of Nazareth, said that this would be a time of trouble unlike any previous time. And I said, I do not tell you this with joy. I say it with grief. There's going to be terrible persecution again in Israel. Terrible. And all the prophets of old predicted it. And there's not a word that indicates it was the Holocaust under Hitler. It's still coming. And as a matter of fact, the servant of the Lord is not the Jewish people in Isaiah 53, because you all want to claim that he is the Redeemer who comes out of, Messiah, uh, out of Zion, that that's the Messiah. Well, that's the same one who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. About that time, he looked at me and he said, I think you are preaching now. <laughs> he said, excuse me, but I do hope and pray. He says, what are your true intentions for we who live in Israel? I thought for a moment, and I said, well, my true intentions is, that, is the same for every Gentile in the world. Every Jew and Gentile, it's my prayer, will bow the knee to Jesus as their Messiah and will confess him as their Lord. And then they all broke out in laughter. And I was kind of broke the tension of the moment. And I wasn't sure what I had done. And uh, he said, you know, he said, David, that's why I like you. We can always count on you to tell us what you're really thinking. And he said, we don't agree with you. But... Uh, I say from my heart, he told me, he said, I hope you are wrong. I just can't imagine suffering again like that. John ate it. It was sweet. God is going to have the victory. But it was bitter in his stomach. Thou must preach. And I wonder about us. Have you got relatives and friends that don't know the Lord? Oh, it's sweet. The Lord's coming. His kingdom's going to be set up. But there's kind of a bitterness in his stomach. Because there is a heaven and there is a hell. And I hope you know the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you're in charge. And thank you, Lord, that you're going to rule and reign over this earth.
that our Lord Jesus is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords, and the whole world is one day going to see him coming in the clouds of heaven, clouds of glory. And Lord, as we think about what's coming in the tribulation, we are excited, thrilled, encouraged, blessed. It is sweet to us. But we are also grieving when we think of family and friends that continue to reject and resist the grace and marvelous kindness of our Lord. For this is the day of salvation. This is the day of opportunity. You tell us to repent and to believe the gospel. You tell us to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. That if we will confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we would be saved. God, I pray that right now by your Spirit you'd cause many people to cry out to God for salvation, for deliverance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.